Welcome my dear friends, it's my pleasure and a great honor to share with you this very important lecture about diagnosis of cardiovascular conditions in COVID-19 patients. The reference for this lecture is a very nice paper recently published by the European Society of Cardiology to guide the diagnosis and the management of cardiovascular disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our agenda will include the clinical presentation, the ECG and the biomarkers and the non-invasive imaging and differential diagnosis. The clinical presentation include chest pain, dyspnea, cough, acute respiratory distress syndrome, cardiogenic shock, out of hospital cardiac arrest, hospitalization for pneumonia, and time course of increase the subsequent risk of cardiovascular death. The first clinical presentation is chest pain. Chest pain and dyspnea are frequent symptoms in COVID-19 patients. Chronic and acute coronary syndrome presentation can be associated with respiratory symptoms. The symptom of chest pain or tightness is common in patients with active COVID-19 infection. It is usually poorly localized and may be associated with dyspnea due to the underlying pneumonia. Associated profound hypoxia together with tachycardia may result in chest pain and the ECG changes suggestive of myocardial ischemia. And when biomarkers are altered, type 2 myocardial infarction may be suggested. Patients with acute coronary syndrome, however, usually experience the more typical symptoms related to ischemia. The presence of COVID-19 infection can make the differential diagnosis more difficult as shortness of breath and respiratory symptom may be present and may precede or precipitate cardiac symptoms and signs. The second clinical presentation is dyspnea. Dyspnea is one of the typical symptoms in COVID-19. Of more than 1,000 adult inpatient and outpatient in China, about 19% presented with dyspnea. With increasing disease severity, the proportion of dyspnea significantly increases, up to 55% in hospitalized patients and up to 92% of patients admitted to the ICU. The third clinical presentation is cough. Cough is present in up, in up to 80% of patients with COVID-19, irrespective of the disease severity. It is usually a dry or unproductive cough. However, it can be productive cough in about one third of the patients. The fourth clinical presentation is acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. ARDS is characterized by bilateral opacification in chest imaging bilateral ground glass appearance in CT and hypoxemia that can't be explained by other causes. Among 1,099 adult inpatients and outpatients in China, ARDS occurred in about 3.5%, but in hospitalized patients, these rates are significantly higher and reaching up to 42%. Very important that the median time from the disease onset to ARDS is from 
8 to 12 days. The risk of ARDS increases with older age above 65 years old, presence of comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension, increases with neutrophilia, lymphocytopenia, and elevated lab markers of organ dysfunction such as LDH, CRP, and D-dimer. And the mortality of patients treated for ERDS in COVID-19 is very high and reaching up to 53%. The fifth clinical presentation is cardiogenic shock. In COVID-19 patients with impaired end organ perfusion at risk of cardiogenic shock, such as large acute myocardial infarction, consider also sepsis as a possible or mixed etiology. Myocarditis should be considered as a precipitating factor for cardiogenic shock. An early, accurate, and rapid diagnosis of cardiogenic shock in patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 is very essential and crucial. The exact incidence of cardiogenic shock in these patients is unknown. However, the median duration between onset of symptoms and admission to ICU in critically ill COVID-19 patients has been 9 to 10 days, suggesting a gradual respiratory deterioration in most patients. In critically ill COVID-19 patients at risk for cardiogenic shock, such as those with large MI, acute decompensated heart failure, sky stage A, and sepsis, a mixed etiology of cardiogenic shock and septic shock should be considered in addition to the sole cardiogenic component. Parameters allowing for differential diagnosis between cardiogenic shock and septic shock, such as presence of vasodilatation and the central venous oxygen saturation may be assessed. In selected cases, such as in patients with unclear reasons for hemodynamic deterioration, invasive hemodynamic monitoring through pulmonary artery catheter may provide useful information. The diagnostic workup of critically ill patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 infection requires specific consideration. The proper level and the type of monitoring in addition to the hemodynamic status of the patient should depend upon the available local resources. Importantly, Key diagnostic testing in patients with suspected cardiogenic shock, including ECG, bedside echo, and urgent or emergent coronary angiography, should be integrated into local diagnostic protocol with dedicated or protected equipment whenever possible to ensure both the best deliverable care and the minimal risk of viral transmission to patients and for healthcare providers as well. Clinical experience and experimental evidence indicating that more than 7.5% myocardial cells have positive ACE2 receptor expression the targets through which the SARS-CoV-2 invade the human cells, suggest that myocarditis may complicate COVID-19. This diagnosis should be considered as a potential cause of cardiogenic shock. 
Another point in the clinical presentation is out of hospital cardiac arrest, pulseless electrical activity, sudden cardiac death, tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia. Symptoms of brady and tachyarrhythmia don't differ from the usual clinical presentation. In the context of COVID-19 pand pandemic, healthcare providers remain alert for symptoms suggestive of brady or tachyarrhythmia as patients are still at risk of conduction disturbance and supraventricular or even ventricular arrhythmia. Healthcare authorities and hospital manager should ensure that there is a proper pathway for the early detection and the management of arrhythm disorder. There is very limited literature available on the occurrence of arrhythmia in the context of infection by SARS-CoV-2 virus. In a study of 138 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in China, arrhythmia was reported in about 17% of the total patients and in about 44% of patients who are admitted to the ICU. In a subsequent publication from the same institute, VT or VF was reported as a complication of COVID-19 in about 6% of patients, with a significantly higher incidence in patients with elevated cardiac troponin T. However, the largest observational study from China, including more than 1,000 patients from about 550 hospitals didn't report any arrhythmia. Hypoxemia and systemic hyperinflammation status may lead to new onset atrial fibrillation, although there are no published data so far. However, important consideration should be given to rhythm management including drug interaction with the COVID-19 treatment and anticoagulation as well. The clinical presentation of Brady or tachyarrhythmias in context of COVID-19 doesn't differ from those previously described, including palpitation, dyspnea, dizziness, chest pain, and syncope. However, there are concerns that in areas where the epidemic is extended, hospitals have experienced a significant decrease in emergency cardiology consultations. Whether the underlying reason is concern for in-hospital catching of infection, a result of self-isolation measures, or a saturation of emergency department and the ambulance, need to be explored. Another very important point in the clinical presentation is hospitalization for pneumonia and the time course of increased subsequent risk of cardiovascular death. Pneumonia, influenza, and SARS are well known to be associated with markedly increased short-term risk for subsequent cardiovascular events such as acute coronary syndrome. There is a need to be alert for cardiovascular events such as acute coronary syndrome, thromboembolic events in the short term after pneumonia, and careful risk management approach in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Pneumonia and the severe influenza infection have been associated with a markedly increased short-term risk of MI and subsequent mortality that is more common among patients at older age, nursing home residents, and patients with history of heart failure, coronary artery disease, or hypertension. For influenza epidemic, 
it has been demonstrated that there is a consistent rise in autopsy confirmed coronary deaths. Fatal acute myocardial infarction have also been observed in the short term after coronavirus associated SARS. Recent data from China suggests that myocardial injury during the COVID-19 infection as indicated by elevated troponin level represent one predictor of higher risk of cardiovascular complications and an adverse clinical outcome. Increased rate of thromboembolic events has been observed in the context of COVID-19 infection as well. The second part of our lecture will be about ECG. The same ECG diagnostic criteria for cardiac condition apply in patients affected by COVID-19 and in general population. So far, no specific ECG changes have been described in patients with COVID-19. Therefore, we have to assume that the overall minimal level of myocardial injury associated with the infection doesn't translate into characteristic ECG manifestation in majority of patients. Although ST segment elevation in the setting of myocarditis have been described. As a consequence, the same ECG diagnostic criteria for cardiac conditions apply in patients affected by COVID-19 infection. Little is known about COVID-19 infection and arrhythmias. In one report on about 140 patients described an arrhythmia in about 17% and the prevalence increased to 44% in patients who were admitted to the ICU. It is also important to consider the risk of arrhythmia, secondary for QT prolongation induced by COVID-19 therapies such as azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. The third part of our lecture will be the biomarkers. Cardiomyocyte injury as quantified by cardiac troponin concentration and the hemodynamic stress as quantified by PNB and N-terminal pro-PNB may occur in COVID-19 infection as in other pneumonia. The level of these biomarkers correlate with the disease severity and mortality. Cardiac troponin and BNB or N-terminal pro-PNB should be interpreted as quantitative variables. In patients hospitalized with COVID-19, mild elevation in cardiac troponin or pre-BNP concentrations are in general the result of pre-existing cardiac disease or acute injury or stress related to COVID-19. In absence of typical angina or ischemic ECG changes, patients with mild elevation, two to three times the upper limit of normal, don't require workup or treatment for type 1 myocardial infarction. In patients with COVID-19, as in patients with other pneumonia, it is suggested to measure cardiac troponin concentration only if the diagnosis of type 1 MI is being considered on clinical background or in presence of new onset left ventricular dysfunction. Independently from diagnosis, monitoring of cardiac troponin may help for prognostication aspect. D-dimer can be increased in one-third of the patients with COVID-19 for miscellaneous reasons. Monitoring of D-dimer concentrations might help to anticipate deteriorating cases, but also can cause confusion regarding the presence of acute pulmonary embolism.
so d dimer level should be interpreted in the context of the clinical presentation other markers of coagulation activation could be monitored for prognostication what about cardiac troponin i or cardiac troponin t COVID-19 is a viral pneumonia that may result in severe systemic inflammation and ARDS and both conditions have profound effects on the heart. As a quantitative marker of cardiomyocyte injury, the concentration of cardiac troponin in patients with COVID-19 should be seen as a combination of presence or extent of pre-existing cardiac disease and acute injury related to COVID-19. Cohort studies from patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in China showed that up to 25% of patients had elevation in cardiac troponin and this finding was more common in patients admitted to the ICU and among those who died. Concentrations remained in the normal range in the, major in the majority of the survivors. In non-survivors, troponin level progressively increased in parallel with the severity of COVID-19 and the development of ARDS. Mild elevation in cardiac troponin, for example, two to three times the upper limit for normal, particularly in an older patient with pre-existing cardiac disease, don't require workup or treatment for type 1 myocardial infarction unless strongly suggested by typical chest pain and ischemic ECG changes. Such a mild elevation are in general will explained by combination of possible pre-existing cardiac disease and acute injury related to COVID-19 infection. However, marked elevation in cardiac troponin concentration, for example, five times the normal value, may indicate presence of shock as a part of, or of COVID-19 infection or may indicate severe respiratory failure or may be associated with the tachycardia or systemic hypoxia, myocarditis, Takutsupo syndrome or even type 1 MI triggered by COVID-19. In absence of symptoms or ECG changes suggestive of type 1 MI, echo should be considered in order to diagnose the underlying cause. Patients with symptoms and ECG changes suggestive of type 1 MI should be treated according to the ESCC guidelines irrespective of the COVID-19 status. What about BNP and N-terminal pro-BNP? BNP and N-terminal pro-BNP as quantitative biomarkers of hemodynamic myocardial stress and heart failure are frequently elevated among patients with severe inflammation or respiratory illness. While experience in patients with COVID-19 is limited, very likely the experience from other pneumonias can be extrapolated to COVID-19. As quantitative markers of hemodynamic stress and heart failure, the concentrations of PNP or N-terminal pro-PNP in a patient with COVID-19 should be seen as combination of presence or extent of pre-existing cardiac disease or acute hemodynamic stress related to COVID-19 or both. At least to some extent, 
the release of BNP and N terminal pro BNP seems to be associated with the extent of right ventricular hemodynamic stress. What about D dimer? D dimers are generated by cleavage of fibrin by prothrombin and indicate the presence of thrombin formation or reflect an unspecific acute phase response from infection or inflammation. D dimer also may indicate the presence of DIC associated with shock. It is thought that markers of activated coagulation or impaired fibrinolysis might contribute to acute myocardial injury, eventually also affecting the coronary capillaries. So markers of hemostasis including activated partial thromboplastin time, prothrombin time, Fibrin degradation products and D-dimers should be monitored routinely. In particular, elevation of D-dimer have been associated with poor outcome. Although the D-dimer have a lower specificity for diagnosis of acute pulmonary embolism, up to 53% of patients still have a normal D-dimer and the majority has D-dimer level below 1000 nanogram per milliliter. So the recommended diagnostic algorithm, including pre-test probability assessment and the D-dimer test can be used in case of suspected acute pulmonary embolism. What are the potential mechanisms underlying the biomarker elevation. The potential mechanisms underlying the myocardial injury in those with COVID-19 are not fully understood. However, in keeping with other severe inflammatory or respiratory illness, direct non-coronary myocardial injury is most likely the cause. Myocarditis septic shock, tachycardia, severe respiratory failure, severe hypoxemia, Takotsubo syndrome, or type 1 MI triggered by COVID-19 are alternative causes. Direct myocardial involvement mediated through ACE2 or cytokine storm or hypoxia induced excessive intracellular calcium leading to cardiac myocyte apoptosis have been suggested as alternative mechanisms. As quantitative biomarker of hemodynamic myocardial stress and heart failure, intracardiac filling pressures and end diastolic cool stress seems to be the predominant trigger of release of PNP or N-terminal pro-BNP. So, which biomarkers should be measured and when? As in patients without COVID-19, cardiac troponin concentrations should be measured whenever on clinical grounds type 1 myocardial infarction is suspected. In patients with COVID-19, diagnostic algorithm for rapid rule out or rule in of myocardial infarction in patients with acute chest pain, such as high sensitive cardiac troponin 0 1 hour algorithm, can be expected to provide a comparable diagnostic performance with very high safety for rule out and a high accuracy to rule in, but with reduced efficacy and a higher percentage of patients remaining in the observed zone. Detailed clinical assessment including chest pain characteristics, assessment of COVID-19 severity, high sensitive cardiac troponin measurement at 3 hours,
and the cardiac imaging including echocardiography are the key elements for identification of myocardial infarction in this heterogeneous subgroup. Similarly, PNP or any terminal pro-PNP should be measured whenever on clinical grounds heart failure is suspected. In patients who are not critically ill, rule in cut of values for heart failure maintain a high positive predictive value even in patients with pneumonia. In contrast, currently recommended cut of value shouldn't be applied in critically ill patients as most critically ill patients have substantial elevation in BNP and in the terminal pro-BNP most likely due to the near universal presence of hemodynamic stress and the heart failure in these patients. It is a matter of ongoing debate whether cardiac troponin should be measured as a prognostic marker in patients with COVID-19. The strong and consistent association with mortality observed in the currently available reports of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 with some evidence suggesting a cardiac troponin even as independent predictor of mortality should be seen in favor of this approach. On the other hand, at this point in time, based on three arguments, we consider a more conservative approach even more appropriate. The first argument is Beyond the cardiac troponin, other routinely available clinical and lab variables have also emerged as strong predictors of death in COVID-19, including older age, higher SOFA score, D-dimer, interleukin-6, and lymphocyte count, and it is unlikely that cardiac troponin provide an incremental value. The second argument is there is a recent risk of inappropriate diagnostic and therapeutic intervention triggered based on cardiac troponin concentration. The third argument, in patients with COVID-19 as well as other pneumonias or patients with ARDS at this point in time, no specific therapeutic intervention can be justified based on use of cardiac troponin as a prognostic marker. So, the routine measurements of cardiac troponin or BNP in patients with COVID-19, given the current very limited evidence for incremental value for clinical decision making, is discouraged. The fourth part of our lecture is about non-invasive imaging. The first rule is don't perform routine cardiac imaging in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Prevent contamination from patients to other patients to imager and imaging equipment. Perform imaging studies in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 only if the management is likely to be impacted by the imaging results. Re-evaluate which imaging technique is the best for your patient, both in terms of diagnostic yield and infectious risk for the environment. The imaging protocol should be kept as short as possible. Non-urgent or elective cardiac imaging shouldn't be performed routinely in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection. Accordingly, non-urgent or elective exams should be postponed until COVID-19 infections has stopped.
The first imaging modality is echocardiography. Avoid performing transthoracic or transesophageal or stress echo in patients in which test results are unlikely to change the management strategy. TE in particular carries an increased risk of spread of COVID-19 due to exposure of the healthcare provider to aerolization of large viral load and shouldn't be performed if an alternative imaging modality is available. In COVID-19 infected patients, the echo should be performed focusing mainly on the acquisition of images needed to answer the clinical question in order to reduce the patient's contact with the machine and with the healthcare provider as well. Point of care ultrasound focus the cardiac ultrasound study and the critical care echocardiography performed at bedside are effective options to screen for cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. Echocardiography can be performed bedside to screen for cardiovascular complication and to guide the treatment. Limited evidence exists for the use of lung ultrasound to differentiate ARDS from heart failure. The presence of dilated right ventricle and pulmonary hypertension may indicate contrast CT to rule out pulmonary embolism. It shouldn't be forgotten that the risk of infection remains in the reading rooms and therefore the material used should be frequently sanitized. What about cardiac CT? Cardiac CT should be performed in hospitalized patients only with indication in which imaging results will likely affect the management. In patients with acute chest pain and suspected obstructive coronary artery disease, multi-slice CT coronary angiography is the preferred non-invasive imaging modality as it is accurate, fast, and minimizes the exposure of patients. Cardiac CT may be preferred to TE in order to rule out left atrial appendage thrombus prior to cardioversion. In patients with respiratory distress, chest CT is recommended to evaluate the imaging features typical of COVID-19. It is very important to check the renal function when contrast is indicated. Cardiac CT should be performed when there is an, a potential impact on clinical management, including evaluation of symptomatic suspected coronary artery disease, acute symptomatic heart valve dysfunction, left ventricular assist device dysfunction, pulmonary embolism or urgent structural heart disease intervention. In patients with respiratory distress, CT chest is recommended to evaluate the, Im the imaging features typical of COVID-19 and to differentiate it from other causes of respiratory distress such as heart failure or pulmonary embolism. However, it, it is shouldn't be used to screen for or as a first line test to diagnose COVID-19 and they should be reserved for hospitalized patients. Very important that a dedicated CT scanner for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 is preferred. As in other imaging modalities, local standards for prevention of virus spread and protection of personnel should be followed. What about nuclear cardiology? Nuclear cardiology should be performed only in specific indications and when no other imaging modalities can be performed. 
the shortest duration of scan time and exposure should be used. Standard dose imaging with rapid protocols of data acquisition are recommended. So, attenuation corrected imaging should be considered. PET scan minimizes the acquisition time. Many of the diagnoses can be evaluated with other imaging modalities that limit the risk of virus spread. Nuclear cardiology tests require long acquisition times with exposure of patients and healthcare provider as well. The use of PET-CT can be limited to patients with suspected endocarditis of prosthetic valve or intracardiac device when other imaging modalities are inconclusive or to avoid the performance of TE which is associated with larger risk of spread. SPECT or PET scan may also be used for diagnosis of ischemia in patients with suspected obstructive coronary artery disease when multi-slice CT coronary angiography is not appropriate or not available. Cardiac MRI Use shortened cardiac MRI protocol focused to address the clinical problem. A check renal function when contrast is indicated. Cardiac MRI is preferred in acute myocarditis. The risk of contamination during cardiac MRI is probably similar to the CT but lower than during an echocardiographic study. Only clinically urgent CMR scan should be accepted. Longer time exposure in the scanner will probably increase the chance of contamination of equipment and the staff. In order to minimize the examination time, Shortened CMR protocol focused to address the clinical problem should be used. A dedicated MR scanner for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 is a clear advantage. And you should allow time for a deep cleaning after each patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection. The role of CMR in COVID-19 patients is currently not clear. Accepted diagnostic indication for CMR should be considered as appropriate in these patients, but shouldn't be performed unless clinically necessary and after a reconsideration of the best-suited imaging technique. Another important attention is the use of CMR contrast in patients with COVID-19. Renal function might be decreased in patients with COVID-19 and might contradict a clinically urgent CMR scan. The last part of our lecture is differential diagnosis. Presence of COVID-19 infection shouldn't preclude a systematic search for cardiovascular events, including acute coronary syndrome. COVID-19 infection related injury should be kept in mind as a differential diagnosis. Other manifestations and complications of COVID-19 infection Mimicking a heart disease should be also ruled out. In COVID-19 infected patients with clinical presentation compatible with cardiovascular disease, three main entities should be considered. The first one is patients with COVID-19 infection can present with cardiac events that can be favored by the infection or unrelated. Those include acute coronary syndrome, either STEMI or non-STEMI, 
acute heart failure, arrhythmias, thromboembolic events, cardiogenic shock, or even cardiac arrest. These syndromes require a quick diagnosis and management and shouldn't be overlooked due to presence of COVID-19 infection. The second category is infection-related cardiac injury can also lead to clinical presentation suggestive of cardiac event and should also be considered as a differential diagnosis. The last one is patients with COVID-19 infection can present with symptoms mimicking cardiovascular events including chest pain, dyspnea, shock, even in absence of cardiac injury. So my final take home message, COVID-19 pandemic represent a worldwide major health problem. The presence of COVID-19 infection can precipitate or mimic acute cardiac events. The interpretations of cardiac biomarkers should be done in the clinical context and it is important to develop local protocols to ensure the safety of healthcare providers and to minimize the risk of infection spread. Thank you so much.